Thank you. Thank you. We're recording. Am I co-host now, Holly? You're co-host. Okay. All right. No, actually, you're the host. Well, let me know when you guys want to get started. Yeah. You want to so, wait a few more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Two more minutes. Julia, you in your car? <laughs> I hope you're not driving. <laughs> <laughs> Who's Diane? Hi, Diane. Hello, everyone. Hello, Holly and everyone. Hello. Oh, Holly, thank you for sending that um, uh, certification request. I will try to take care of it tomorrow. Welcome. In between my class I'm so stuff. happy you're doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You'll be happier when you get those two boxes of papers out of your garage. You know what? I just took a carload of things to get it, them shredded today. And I'm thinking that, that that box of Ibert stuff's next. Yep. Yep. We're getting everything online now. So. Yep. Let's go back 25 years. Wow. I have a few hundred files I have to have shredded. I keep putting them off and then they grow. I just spent $110 yeah, they do. at the shredder today. I couldn't believe it. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap. I have a little shredder, but it would have taken me three weeks to do it. Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, that make a nice, you know, background noise as you're working with a client. And the sound of the shredder will take you even deeper. <laughs> Whole new technique has just been born. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. That word might be a little scary for them. Shredder. Yeah, it sounds like a dentist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's shred, let's shred the parts of your past that it's time to let go. There you of. go. That's good wording. Yeah, that's that, a good word. Should we get started? Okay. All right. So I want to thank all of you for being here. It's a delightful to see you, especially some old friends I haven't seen for a while. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Virginia Waldron. I'm also known as Kiki. Most here, everyone knows me as Kiki. Um, and we are going to have a wonderful uh, meeting tonight shared by Holly and Peter. It's going to be about two hours. So it's going to be a little bit longer than, than we normally run them just because there's so much good stuff here to share. And there will be notes for anyone who wants them. Uh, how do we want to do the notes, Holly? Um, I will email them. Okay. Yeah. Uh, everybody who registered, I have your email. If you did not register and you just showed up, text me or email me. Actually, don't text me. My phone's not working right now. Um, don't, do don't, 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 don't do text me. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, one of the things, uh, a couple of announcements I want to make, and then there's something we want to talk about. But um, where did I put it? Where did I put it? My announcements, my list of announcements. Here we go. No, that's not it. I'm gonna have to wing it, Holly. Okay. Um, so uh, future gatherings are um lined up. November's oh. gathering is going to be the twenty first. Right. Right. And it's going to be our final um, panel discussion of authors from our book. Um, the authors are going to be wonderful people. Um, Georgina, Georgina, are you one of them? What is in progress? Yes. Um, I don't know. Am yes, I? You are. Yes, she is. Okay. You are, Georgina. <laughs> You've now been informed. Um, I'm going to be one of them. Um, okay. okay. Uh, What's the date on that again, please? <laughs> <laughs> that would help. The twenty first. I'm, um, I'm one of them. I'm one of them. Twenty first of what? November. Okay. Okay. Um. Anyway, there's going to be three more authors, and it's going to be free to the public, and of course, free to members. And it, it starts at the usual time. So the on, on the Zoom call. Okay. Uh, can you just tell me what's happening? Can you guys, can you guys mute yourselves, please? So it's okay. Um, 
Then December's gathering is going to be members only. We're going to have a solstice celebration, but for members only. And of course, for members, it's free. And January's gathering, Diane um, is going to be doing a um, astrology thing with us, right? Like a forecast. Right. For, for 2025. I, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to do that. Okay. Um, so our audio book is going to be um, available by Thanksgiving around then. Uh, and it's wonderful. The, the the person who is reading the, the audio book, put our book on audio is going to be, is doing a wonderful job. Um, for tonight, if once we get started with the actual gathering, if you could please mute yourself if you're not already and put your cam um, turn the camera part off so that it's just Peter and Holly talking together and the rest of us are going to be quietly listening until we're ready to ask questions. Questions will be at the end and we'll just sort of help everybody get along with that. Um, and then um, Holly and Peter are going to be presenting this on the same subject, which is spirit releasement therapy, but from two different therapeutic approaches. So it's going to be really interesting to see the different ways that people can do this wonderful technique. And as I said, notes will be available um, afterwards. Um, so there's one thing that we need to talk about. There's a lot of you here who are new and uh, are not members. There's three types of members. There's a student membership. There's the affiliate membership and there's the full certified membership. And all three of those people, this gathering is offered at no charge. But if you are not one of those three members, when you signed on, you should have paid the $20 fee. So if that's you, if that applies to you, um, you're here. We're glad you're here. Welcome, welcome. But maybe you might consider donating the $20. Go back to the website and not now. Uh, and and click on the donate button and donate twenty dollars just to kind of make that up. There was a there was a, a disconnect on the website about who could come for free and who would pay the twenty dollars. So if, if you would kindly um, make that up, that would be very much appreciated. Um, I think that's all the announcements, right, Holly? Mm -hmm. All right, so. Uh, everybody, if you commute yourselves, like I'm going to do in a moment, and turn your camera off so we can have just our two speakers on the video, that would be great. Okay. All right. Thank you so much again for coming. It's delightful. Greg, you need to mute. There you go. And now do your video. Turn your video about the same, same area on your Zoom at the bottom. Kiki, maybe you could help. There you go. Okay. All right. So Peter's going to start with the presenting, but I'm going to begin with some protection to help us have an energetic protection in place. And um, this is a technique that I use a lot for myself every day, and I use it with clients all the time, but it's especially important that I use it when I do any spirit releasement so that we have energetic boundaries in place and a sense of containment in our own domain and that we're less susceptible for any kind of contamination as, as we do this work. And this particular process I learned through the work of Alice Bailey and a book by some of her disciples called The Rainbow Bridge, just so you know what the reference is. So I will do it with all of us right now. So get comfortable, close your eyes, take a deep breath. And I'll begin with the soul mantra. We are the soul. We are the light divine. We are love. We are will. We are fixed design. In the wisdom of our soul, we invoke a star of energy six inches above our head as a representation of our higher self. In the wisdom of our soul, we begin with a vortex 30 feet above us, moving 30 feet beneath us into the earth. This vortex continually moves as a way to keep us grounded, focused, and protected as we do this work. 
And as we do releasement work, if there's any releasing debris of any kind, this vortex will immediately move it out of our energetic sphere so that our energy is constantly being purified. And this protection will be in place while we do this work together. And in the wisdom of the soul, imagine way above the earth, a star of energy that represents our group soul star, the quantum field connection that we share energetically. And imagine that your individual star is linked to this group soul star so that we are experiencing the, the beautiful collective energy of consciousness that we can share in this work today. We bless all who are present and ask only for the highest good from this work today. And we give thanks for the opportunity to grow, learn, and share it. So be it. So it is. Okay, Peter, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. So what is spirit releasement therapy? Spirit releasement therapy is the healing modality that deals with the psychological issues by identifying and clearing earthbound spirits, negative entities, and other intruder energies from the client's energy field. When compared with more traditional therapeutic modalities, this particular approach has often been found to be even more effective and efficient in identifying, healing, and resolving a wide range of mental, emotional, psychosomatic, and spiritual issues and illnesses. And often positive results can be achieved much more quickly than through traditional talk therapy. So today, Holly and I are gonna talk about various aspects of uh, spirit releasement. And I'd like to begin with the 10 most common signs of spirit attachments. Number one, low energy level or sudden loss of physical energy. Two, character shifts or mood swings. Three, inner voices speaking to you, especially if those voices are negative. And to me, that's very, very important. Four, Abuse of drugs, including alcohol. Five, impulsive behavior. Six, memory problems or poor concentration. Seven, repetitious nightmares, especially if nightmares contain elements of violence. Eight, sudden onset of anxiety or depression. Nine, sudden onset of physical problems with no obvious cause. Typically, these changes are not supported by usual lab tests or x-ray findings. Also, pains that move about the body, as well as pain that can fail to respond to traditional medical treatments. And finally, number 10, a strong emotional and or physical reaction to attending this presentation. <laughs> so now that I've got your attention and probably freaked some of you out because you have three or more of these common signs of spirit attachments, let's continue. So Holly, how to, okay. talk about how to educate and prepare a client for the process. So one of the, the first thing is the concept of protection, which I just alluded to as I basically guided us all through it. And the most important way you can protect yourself and help your client is through your intention of having a good boundary. So holding that intention that you're not there to absorb, to take it on, you're there to support and have your own domain pure and, and grounded and secure. And one of the things that happens with spirit releasement is that people who are confronting what to them is often the unknown are feeling a lot of fear. And it's really important that they understand that this is a process that is based on love, not fear. And anyone who's been exposed to the concept of exorcisms probably is going to have fear because exorcisms do not look very happy or very fun to participate in at all. And the fear is something that needs to be addressed right up front in a way. So when, when I work with people who are feeling the fear, I talk about the concept of our shadow and how we project shadows and how our unhealed parts are going to be supported in this work and that the love of this work is what's going to heal both them and any energetics that might be present. So that is the most important thing that we can hold is that sense of love to not be vulnerable. So it's gonna strengthen us. When we're fearful, we are more vulnerable. Then the other thing is to work with empowering the client and also empowering the entity 
to always go for the highest good for all concerned, uh, to work with the concept that we are not doing anything to anyone. We are supporting them and having an opening for healing for both the client and the entity. So it's an empowering, loving process. We are not using force or power over, and we're not working um, against against any energetic. I think of it as verbal Tai Chi or energetic Tai Chi, where you join, you therapeutically align, and then you work together, supporting, following the energy so that there can be transformation for all, all the parties. And we always work in the light, always invoking the light and the higher selves of the client and the higher selves of the entities so that you can know that the work is coming for the highest good and for the highest healing for all concerned. And that intention is really, really important to bring to the session as a practitioner so that, again, you are in your own domain and you have the resilience that you need to be safe to facilitate this work yourself. So some of, some of the examples of um, working for protection, I think, are important to talk about. The one that I used is really helpful. But we hear people talk about they want to call in the light. And where spirit releasement is concerned, we don't want to call the light from out there because if there are entities hovering around, you're going to bring those entities into the force field. So when we work with the light, have the light from within fill the body and then fill the space and auric field around the body to create protection. And that again is another aspect of empowerment, mm -hmm. that the auric field is filled with our own light mm -hmm. our own spiritual energy as a way to protect ourselves and then some people work with mm -hmm. rings of fire around the auric field Lynn, how are you somebody's got a mic on you need to put the mics off jill yeah i'm so sorry michaela yeah have your mics off please so the ring of fire is a way to burn off negative energy and to create a boundary and another thing for protection is Peter's going to talk about working with guides and helpers, but check their credentials. Just because a guide and a helper is there does not mean they are there for the highest good. They may have their own agenda. They may be psychically codependent. So check the credentials. And I know that Peter's going to give you ways that you can do that, proclamations you can make or questions you can ask. One of the ways that I check guides is by asking the client to describe the color around the guide. If it's a pure, clear color, a crystalline color, that's a very positive sign. If it's murky or de dense or dark or fuzzy, probably not from the light. And you can always say, what, by what authority are you here? I bless you into the light as a way to move any energies that are there that are not really from the light to support the process. So Peter's going to talk about some of the symptoms now. Okay. So there are two types of intruders that we're going to be focusing on today. The first is earthbound spirits. Earthbound spirits are the surviving consciousness of people who, when they died, did not go completely into the light. Part of them went into the light, but not all of them. And they become mired in the fourth dimension, the lower astral realm, and are looking for a place to hide. They're quite similar to ghosts, but ghosts are, attract, are attached to places and things Earthbound spirits are attached to people. These spirits can include terminated pregnancies and mind fragments of living people. These earthbound spirits are driven by the same memories, needs, desires, appetites, and emotions that they had when they were alive. They're seeking companionship or influence over us because we're alive. So here are two reasons why spirits are attracted to us. Environmental reasons. Attachment may be completely random, even accidental. We happen to be walking by a car accident. We visited a hospital and we were unprotected or vulnerable, or we were sitting in a bar drunk on alcohol or high on drugs. Another major reason why spirits are attracted to us is that karmic reasons. Often this involves spirits from previous lifetimes or earlier in this lifetime, and are part of our soul's unfinished business. So how do they get into us? Well, as we all know, our physical body is protected by our immune system, and our spirit body, of course, is protected by our aura. But due to trauma, 
overuse of alcohol, marijuana, or other drugs, or having a big heart and seeking to help the world without boundaries, that your aura can become weak, just like Swiss cheese. And these intruders can move in through holes in the aura and set up housekeeping. Talk therapy says they don't exist, but they do. And they can create havoc within you and your clients. What I find is that in my own practice, about 60% of my clients have one or more outside intruder in interfering with them. But I've been doing this for, for 25 years and I'm uh, well versed in how best to deal with these uh, types of, of energies. And so I think spirit sends them to me because I can be of assistance to the client. So what are the qualities of these earthbound spirits? Well, the attachment can be benevolent in nature, self-serving to fulfill a personal need of the spirit, malevolent in intention, or completely neutral. These spirits can attach to the aura or float within the aura, connected to one of our own spirit bodies. The spirit can interfere with any aspect of the life of the unsuspecting host. They do not require our permission to be there. In fact, the host is usually unaware of the presence of attached spirits. Their thoughts, desires, and behaviors of an attached entity are experienced as the person's own thoughts, desires, and behaviors. Often, and this I find to be fairly true, the host experiences a negative voice within them that's criticizing them. The problem is often codependency between the client and the spirit. In fact, in most cases, a person only realizes the reality of the attachment once the spirit has been released. So in other words, they're basically parasites looking for a place to hide. And they move into us and take advantage of that situation. So how do they affect us? Well, they are attracted to us because they resonate with our own negative and positive emotions. They seek companionship or influence over us because we're alive and they are not. They bring with them the same negative thoughts, feelings, attitudes, and beliefs that they had when they had their own physical bodies when they died. Fear, anxiety, anger, depression, sadness, health issues, relationship issues. And the list includes practically any issue that can cause you or your clients to seek therapy. In other words, like attracts like. So in summary, earthbound spirits are immensely frustrated confused and unhappy. They can find no peace or lasting satisfaction while inhabiting other people's bodies. They're truly lost souls and their influence is almost always negative. There's a better place for them to be, which is with loved ones and all those who reside in whatever they call or you call heaven. So we've talked about earthbound spirits. Let's talk about the second major category negative entities. Negative entities are spirits of evil intent from the lower astral realm of the fourth dimension. They have never had a physical body. In the third dimension, we have a world of opposites. We have hot and cold, male and female, beautiful and ugly, good versus bad. This is the bad. Generally, they join us to create problems for us because they feed off the negative emotions that they trigger in our day-to-day -day activities of being human. Their negativity can cause or make worse your feelings of anxiety, fear, confusion, depression, and other negative emotions. These intruders can cause pains in all parts of your body and can trigger you and make your own mental, emotional, or physical issues much worse. They can help keep you stuck or unable to move forward in your life, or they can stop you on your spiritual journey. Because typically, their goal is to disrupt the progress within you, your spiritual growth. But keep in mind, as Holly mentioned, these entities were once a part of the light. Everything was once a part of the light. And that's one of the keys that we keep in mind in dealing with them. 
Overall, most of them are rather bratty, not so bright underlings that enjoy harming us by getting you into trouble and then feeding off your own negative emotions that they help to create. So how do they, these earthbound spirits and negative entities attach to us? Well, as I've mentioned in passing, they attach themselves and merge with the subconscious mind of a living person. In the majority of cases, there's a blending of the personalities and the onset of the presence of the intruder may only be vaguely perceived, if at all. They do not need or require the permission of the host, as I mentioned. Um, in fact, typically we're unaware that they're there. But once there, the negative spirit can exert some degree of control on your thoughts and emotions, as well as produce physical sensations and affect the health of your physical body. The thoughts, desires, behaviors of an attached entity are experiences our own thoughts, desires, and behaviors. And so um, just be aware of that within yourself and especially within your clients. So what does talk therapy say about earthbound spirits and negative entities? Well, as I mentioned earlier, with talk therapy, they don't exist because we can't see them. But in fact, they are present. Um, so during a session with a client, what I'm seeking to do is to create a level playing field in that first session, that if there are any intruders present, we can get rid of them and the, the client can take back their power and we'll have a level playing field for further work that can also occur in that first session as well. Um, Holly, so differential diagnosis, please. Well, actually you're ahead of me a little bit. I'm, yeah. I'm going back to educating clients about how it works. Perfect. So when a client comes in for past life therapy, it's, it's a probable experience for a client to have an entity show up. And the point of diagnosing is the death experience in the past life. At the death experience, we would expect the client to describe some aspects of what we know about near-death experiences of leaving the body, feeling as separate from the pain, from the anxiety of the life, feeling a sense of lifting and lightening up and moving towards the light. If in the past life regression, the client does not describe that and you ask what's happening now, what's happening now, and they feel lost, confused, they're in darkness, or they feel some kind of addiction drawing them in, or they feel a lot of grief and unfinished business about their life and they do not move on, it's very probable that what you are dealing with is the past life of an entity, not the client. And that would be at the point where you would start asking the questions of the entity or of the client entity, whichever it is, to find out who's on first. And I'm gonna give you some pointers of how to determine if it's a past life, if it's a spirit guide, if it's a sub-personality, if it's a multiple personality, because all of those aspects of consciousness are potentially going to show up in your hypnotherapy work. There are two ways that past life therapists or hypnotherapists, if you're not doing past life therapy, are going to experience moving into doing a spirit releasement. The first one is spontaneous. For instance, you might be working with someone who's having a recurring dream. And this is an actual case I wanted to share with you. A woman described having a reoccurring dream for many years of walking a plank. And at the point where she was going to be forced off the plank into the water, she would wake up. And so her request in therapy was to do some dream work about this nightmare dream to figure out what was this dream's meaning for her. And what we came to through doing a dream re-entry process that I use a lot with dream work was dialoguing with the one on, on the plank, walking off, forced off into the water to finish the dream by actually being off the plank and finding out what happens next. And what came through was that it was an actual entity's working out its death experience through her dream work, through her dream state. So we did a spirit releasement on this entity who'd been plagued for many, many years, who came to her at a very young age, and she was relieved of the dream, and the entity was free to move on. So that's an example of a spontaneous one. 
Another example of a very interesting spontaneous spirit releasement came through doing a stop smoking session with hypnotherapy. And for those sessions, I use a neurolinguistic programming technique of, of voice dialogue with talking to the part that wants to change, talking to the part that doesn't want to change. And when we spoke to the part that didn't want to change, it was not my client, very obviously not my client. It was a man who had who had been hit by a train when he was on the train tracks doing a drug deal with people out of the, the milieu of daily life who um, was a chain cigarette smoker who was killed suddenly. And my client, when she was a teenager, would leave school with a group of friends and go down to the railroad tracks to, start to smoke and smoke pot. And that's when she attached, this entity attached to her, and she'd been smoking up through her 30s from the effects of this smoking entity. And what she described when I did the interview was, I hate smoking. I don't like the taste of it. I hate the smell of it. I don't have any understanding of why I continue to smoke, but I can't help myself. Well, it turned out that she wasn't helping herself. She was helping him. So when he left, the next act, and also this is interesting because this woman was a student that I did this demonstration in one of my hypnotherapy trainings, and she dressed kind of, um, I don't know how to describe it, kind of campy, you know, very neutral gender kind of dressing and kind of rough around the edges. And the next day she came with her hair down in a dress. <laughs> and everybody in class noticed the transformation. And she says, yeah, I haven't worn a dress in about 10 years. She says, I just felt like I was more myself today. I could wear a dress. So she has some very, very uh, explicit responses from the, the spirit releasement, including the fact that she didn't want to smoke anymore. So the other way that you will have a spirit releasement show up is by doing a head-on process of exploring to whether or not the client has entities. And I'm actually going to take you through the process of doing that as we complete our, our talking about sort of the theory of this today. But here's an example of a head-on one where a woman came in, had been to doctors, alternative practitioners, healers, everything she could imagine. And her symptom was an undiagnosable, severe burning pain on the left side of her body. And it was relentless. It never stopped. She was being plagued and going crazy from this pain. So we did a process of a, a body scan, which I will teach you in a little bit. And through the body scan, she saw this burning energy on the left side of her body. And we talked to the energy behind the pain and discovered that it was an Asian man from Japan who had been in the Hiroshima bomb. And he, his left side of the body was facing the blast and at the blast, his body melted. And the reason he was with her is because she was on a tour in Japan near where the bomb went off. And he saw her as a compassionate, loving person who had a very um, intuitive knowing and thought maybe she could help him get, get out of this conundrum he was in because he thought he went to the light. He thought he went to the light by going into the blast, but it was not the light. It was the blast. So we helped him move on and the pain immediately left her body after that session. So that was an example of somebody who says, I think I need help with a spirit releasement. And another interesting case was a man who grew up living above his father's mortuary. And he was a very intuitive young person who would watch his father prepare the bodies for burial. And during that time, he would start to communicate with the bodies, the people who are hanging around the bodies, and the, the people would go home with him at night. Mm -hmm. And he was collecting these spirits over the years that were causing him to have a clogged up life, uh, non-directed will, and all kinds of physical and emotional issues. And he had the capacity to imagine that something like that might have been affecting him since he was very cognitively aware of these spirits that he was talking to every day and every night. So we did a series of spirit releasements to help these folks move on. And he had to learn how to develop some energetic boundaries uh, so that he wasn't going to be so susceptible in his caring, emotional, open-hearted state to not be a uh, landing pad for more spirits. So that was a beautiful experience with more of a head-on approach. 
So how do you prepare a client who's doing a past life regression for the possibility that there may be a spirit attachment? And you can talk to them about that diagnostic point of the death, and that you will be taking them through the death. And you also can educate them that they do not have to believe in spirits. They do not have to believe in past lives to do the work. They can look at it as a worn out, unwelcomed energetic pattern. And I will often frame it in that way so that people can have a more secular perspective of this or a more imaginative perspective of this process without having to have a belief in spirits or any spiritual orientation. And we talk about it as energy hygiene, that we all go through life and we have bumps and grinds and we have toxic experiences and that sometimes these energy patterns are dragging us down, keeping us stuck, and that this is one symbolic process, whether it's real or not, it's for them to decide, that can help them do some energetic hygiene work on themselves to lighten up and to perhaps move off some patterns that are disrupting their life. So that's a really uh, lovely way just to hold it and to offer it up to any client from any background and any perspective so that they can do the work. Think of it as an alchemical energy healing process through the metaphor of it. Okay, Peter, you can take the next one. All right, so now I'd like to share my particular approach of working with guides and spirit helpers um, using this particular protocol that I developed over, over the years. Um, so I'd like to take, take you steps by step through the process. Um, and so let's pretend that you're a potential client named Alice. So we get together for a two hour hypnosis session. I take you into trance and then on a guided visualization up into the fifth dimension. In that high vibration, we can easily access your heart, your higher self and other guidance available to us. We then partner with them because they know everything about you from this life and past lives. And so, to, in order to meet with them, I guide you into a very high vibration in the light by counting to 10 three times with a lot of visualizations involved. And once we're there in the fifth dimension, I ask you to describe whatever you see or sense or feel in that special place. Should also add something I just uh, neglected to say. I recently came upon a quote from Albert Einstein who said that it's very difficult to deal, resolve issues in the energy that you're in right now. But if you go to a higher energy, a higher uh, uh, place, a point of view, and look down on the particular situation, it's quite easy to help uh, resolve whatever the issue might be. So in fact, that's what we're doing here. I'm taking you up into the light, high vibration, and we're inviting your guidance to join us to lead the session for us. In fact, as I say to my clients, we're bringing your to-do list to the session and the guidance is bringing their to-do list <laughs> and their list takes precedence over yours because they know where we need to go first and they'll take us there. So we're now up in the fifth dimension. I ask the client to describe whatever you see or sense or feel in that special place, whatever comes to mind. And then one by one, I invite your heart and then your higher self to join us as if you were channeling them. And you may experience each of these as an image or a feeling or a presence or a knowing or maybe an inner voice. So as the heart comes forward, I ask, how do you experience it? Oh, I, I see it's a red heart right out in front of me. Great. So let's invite that red heart right out in front of you to come forth right now with words like, I'm here. I'm here, says your heart, through you. How do you support Alice? And will tell us. Well, then ask your higher self to join us. How does your higher self make itself known to you? Again, see it, sense it, or feel it. For those like me who are more auditory or sensing or feeling, it could be, oh, I can feel my higher self standing right behind me. It's warm, it's loving. In fact, it just said to me, it has my back. All right, so let's invite that energy to come forth through you with words like, I'm here. I'm here, says your higher self. How do you support Alice? It will tell us. Um, I then... Now, I should also add that with the higher self, um, we're dealing with voices. I hope it's your higher self, but it could be any voice at all. So ask a key question for the higher self and others from the light. 
Are you in service to the light and love of the one infinite creator? If it is not your higher self or not Archangel Michael or a wisdom figure who's joined us from the light, it cannot lie and say, I sure am. So that's what I use to make sure we're talking to the highest possible energy from the light during the session. Um, so Archangel Michael joins us. I ask him if he's in service light and love one of the creator after the client has described how the client connects with that energy. You may see it, sense it, or feel it. Um, I then ask your heart, your higher self, and Archangel Michael to join together as our inner wisdom team that we're partnering with. Um, with the team already then formed, because we'll be working with them for your highest good to achieve the goals that we set for our session. And then I'll ask Archangel Michael to scan your energy field and let me know through you, through him, if there are any intruders present, yes or no. If yes, how many are present? He'll tell me through you. And at this point, I may, if appropriate, ask him if both you and I are sufficiently protected by the light. Because as Holly mentioned right up front, it's very important to make sure that the client and, and I are completely protected so I do my own protection right up front for the client. And at this point in the session, make sure that in fact, all that protection is in place. Um, and so then, now the protection is there. I ask, since we know there are two intruders, let's say, according to Archangel Michael, I demand that the first intruder come forth right now with words like, I'm here. So I then will question this intruder by asking, are you a part of Alice or something else? First thought. Now that question has three possible answers. The first answer could be, I'm a part of Alice. Okay, could be an inner child, could be a past life personality, could be a spirit guide or a positive emotion, but generally it's a part of you that is a positive force that then as we get to know it can in fact uh, join our inner wisdom team. If it turns out to be a spirit guide or a very positive part that knows everything that there is to know about you. So are you a part of Alice or something else? Second possible answer is something else. All right, so something else. Have you ever had your own human body? Yes or no? If yes, I'll ask the spirit to describe that body that they once had. In other words, was it male or female or something else. I'll then ask a variety of questions of that energy to find out even more if it's in fact a human body that it had. For example, how did you die? When did you first come in contact with Alice? How old was she? What allowed you to get into her energy field? And how have you been affecting her since your arrival? And how many others like you are present as well? and are affecting Alice right now. So what I find is that often the client can easily channel these answers through first thought, first feeling, first image, first voice, because I've instructed the client right up front that your soul speaks through your imagination. And so therefore I invite you to simply to share first thought, first feeling, first image, first voice, because through that we can truly have your guidance come through you and me as the session unfolds. So we now know that there is at least, at least one intruder energy present. So how do we get rid of earthbound spirits? Well, um, I then asked Archangel Michael to come back along with his angels of the white light to join us and let me know when they've arrived. They've arrived, okay. Then I asked the spirit because we're now talking to that earthbound a bit more information about how they've been affecting the client to get more of the story of what occurred. And then when I have the story and I have a sense that, oh my gosh, this is something that happened, maybe it's and how the, the, the intruding energy has been affecting the client. Who did you love the most when you had your own human body? Oh, my wife, my mother, my child, whatever it is. Well, that your wife has been looking for you and searching for you because she's passed on before this individual the spirit. And now that you've come forth, um, she knows where you are. In fact, she just joined us in that shaft of light over there. 
Do you see her? Yes. Ask her to join you right now. Um, how does she greet you? Is she happy to see you? Um, I then uh, often the, uh, the mom or the wife or whatever is so pleased to see the loved one. And the spirit is now realizing that there's hope for them. So I then, we talk about how the earthbound spirit has been harming you, Alice. Um, and I seek then at that point to, uh, just a second here. Yes, to get a forgiveness because um, what goes around comes around. And so I'm hoping that through this conversation, we can have the earthbound spirit apologize to the client and have the client uh, accept the apology. And this generally happens without too much drama. Um, and then I ask, uh, because then I, then I ask the client to demand that the earthbound spirit leave. Um, but fortunately, the wife, the mom, whatever is present and they will escort this one into the light. Um, but before they go, I ask the earthbound to gather up everything that it brought into you, every thought, feeling, attitude, and belief, or created while they have been within you, to gather it all up right now and place it at your feet, outside your aura, um, so it can be, um, so we can get rid of it. So out of curiosity, I'll then say to the client, once that stuff is at the client's feet, how big is it? Is it bigger than a suitcase? Because I'm sort of curious. We then invite Archangel Michael to transmute that energy into white light. So it completely disappears. Then I ask Archangel Michael to escort the earthbound spirit and the loved one um, into the light and ask you to watch them as they go to make sure they leave. And once they've left, I ask Archangel Michael to return and tell us if there are any more spirits present that we can send to the light as well. So we'll then go through the process again. Um, then afterwards, I'll ask you, as the after the spirit is left, how does that feel? And typically, you feel much lighter. So that's <coughs> how I how I deal with earthbound spirits. So now let me move on to the protocol I use for releasing negative entities. Um, next steps. As before, we ask Archangel Michael to scan your field. Let me know if there are any intruders present. If so, how many? And then make sure that you're, you're sufficiently protected as am I by the light. And then I'll ask the question, um, are you a part of Alice or something else? Something else. Have you ever had your own human body? No, most likely it could be a negative entity. So what's your purpose in being with Alice? Generally, it is joined. Now, we are um, surrounding this energy with nets and webs of pure white light um, at this point, uh, thanks to Archangel Michael and the angels of the white light, asking the angels to hold the nets snug, tighten them slowly and steadily, forcing this energy to get smaller and smaller and forcing the energy to speak the truth. So I'll then ask about how have you been affecting Alice? Um, and get the story behind the story here. Um, because typically the negativity can cause feelings of depression, anxiety, health issues, whatever that is creating issues for the, or causing the client's own mental, emotional, physical health to be less than it should be. So what's your source? Who sent you? Sometimes the voice will say Satan or the devil or whatever. No big deal. How long have you been with Alice? At what age did you join her? How did you get into her energy field? How many others like you are present within Alice now? So giving answers to questions like this gives us even more information about how the client's been affected. Depending upon the negativity, the amount of it, um, I may call upon other forces to help me. Other archangels, Master Jesus, Mother Mary, the Arcturians, the Ashtar Command. Help is all around. If karma is involved, because along the way I'll ask um, Archangel Michael if karma is involved. If so, I'll invite Kuan Yin and the Karmic Council to join us. 
as well as others from the light who can offer their guidance and protection. And if Kuan Yin is involved, we will do a divine decree of forgiveness that can help everyone come to closure here. Um, in fact, a couple of years ago, I did a presentation involving getting rid of negative entities and talk in more detail about mm -hmm. Kuan Yin and the Karma Council to help. And that's found on the IVRT website. So, um, but through this, help is always available from the light. And I am eager to call everybody forth to assist us to make sure not only is my client safe, am I safe, but are we doing everything possible to release these energies, um, sending them back where they came from or sending them into the light or wherever God intends for them to go. Um, so at that point then, um, we are seeking then to, um, once, uh, once we're all set for them to go, or we've, I'll then um, ask you, do you want to have that negativity within you any longer? And of course you say no, because you're in charge of you. And so then I'll ask Archangel Michael to take all that negative energy that is still surrounded by those strong nets and webs of pure white light and carry it far from Alice into the light at the count of three. One, two, three, I clap my hands and say, go now. Then ask you, are they gone completely? And then how are you feeling? I'll then ask Archangel Michael to return and have him scan your body once again to see if there are any more layers of these intruders present. If so, we get rid of them using a similar protocol. And then I'll ask if there's anything more that we need to do or can do to create a level playing field within you of just the client without any of these intruders and Archangel Michael and others, your heart and higher self and those from the light who joined us, perhaps will share at that point other suggestions that they have about how you can uh, take good care of yourself. We'll then continue on with the rest of the session by working with your inner wisdom team to take off layer after layer of other issues that now can be resolved much more easily because we have released the intruder energy that's been keeping you stuck. Uh, I, often what I find is that we can release these earthbound spirits, these negative entities, in just one two hour hypnotherapy session. Um, but ongoing therapy may be necessary to heal the vulnerability or anything else at first allow this negativity to get into your energy field. Um, and on occasion, these intruders can return. So this is not, once they're gone, they'll never come back. No, you need to keep your energy strong, your aura strong, so that you have a strong aura and they cannot penetrate your energy field. Holly. Okay, I'm gonna do a share screen here. Okay, I'm gonna, this is called who's on first. How do you determine who or what you are dealing with when energetic patterns show up in a hypnotherapy session? So a spirit attachment is only one of them. And here are a list of different ones. And I have some ways that you can differentially diagnose or assess who's on first. So a subpersonality. Does a subpersonality have a previous existence or a previous history and body? No, they are a part of the construct of the client's psyche. Does a subpersonality know about other parts? Yes, the whole point of psychosynthesis work is to have these parts start to work together instead of against each other. So they all share co-consciousness. Does a subpersonality have an archetypal death experience? No, it's always been part of the client. The purpose of a subpersonality is for, for protection and to create a synthesis and wholeness. And the needs in therapy is integration. So that's one, one aspect. The next is a past life, which all of you are very familiar with. Does a past life have a previous existence or previous history and body? Yes. Does it know the other parts? It is accessible or it does know the other parts, the other lifetimes. 
Does it have an archetypal death experience? Yes, it does. And by that, I mean what's described in the near-death experience of leaving the body and being free to move on to the light. The purpose of a past life is for growth and expansion of consciousness. And the needs and past life therapy are always knowing the purposes and remembering and learning the lessons and completing the karmic patterns. Then you could have an entity. And Peter's done a great job of describing different types of entities that are attached. Does an entity have your previous existence or previous history and body? Yes, if it had been human. And he described also that some are, have never been human, but it does have a separate sense of self from the body of the client. Does it know about other parts? It mostly often will, but not always. It's not always aware. Does it have an archetypal death experience? No, because they stayed in that lower last astral realm and they never went to the light. So they're in some form of darkness or lower frequency. Does an entity, uh, what's the entity's purpose and function? Always for self-service. It's always there for its own needs. If it thinks it's there to help the client, it's because it's codependent, not because it's actually got the higher purpose in mind. It's always got self-service underneath. And does the entity, what the entity needs in therapy is releasing into the light and doing therapy with the entity so they can release to the light if something's holding them in the body or holding them on the, the earth plane. A spirit guide. Does a spirit guide have a previous existence or previous history and body? Yes, they can. Or maybe they have, maybe they're more angelic guides. They've never had a spirit, a physical body. Does the spirit guide know the other parts? Yes, it has very strong awareness of that higher self connection. Does the spirit guide have an archetypal death experience? If it had been human, it would obviously have had one because it's in the light now. Does it purpose in, uh, in its existence with the client is always for true service and the highest good? And the needs in therapy is to establish communications with the spirits, the spirit guides, so they can have the direct experience of their support. Then there's a multiple personality. Does a person with multiple personality have parts or alters, as they're called, that have had previous existences or previous history and a body? No, but... It is highly probable that someone who is a multiple personality will also have entities. So there needs to be a way to differentiate when you do the parts work with someone with multiple personality, which is not the term that's used anymore. It's called, um, I can think of it right now, but there's a whole term that we use, the psycho, psycho babble term that the multiple personality aspects do not know about each other. That's the whole diagnostic point is that there, there is no shared consciousness. So maybe a part that was severely abused is holding all the memories to keep it separate from the rest of the psyche so the psyche can still function. So usually the parts do not know about each other or they can through therapy. Some may know, but most of the time you they don't know about each other. Does a multiple personality have an archetypal death experience? No, because it's always been a construct of the client's psyche. The purpose of a multiple personality, those altars are there for protection always because of the extreme abuse that someone sustained. And a multiple personality's needs in therapy is to gently uncover the trauma, reconnecting and separating the personalities the separate personalities into an integration and wholeness. And then there's a walk-in phenomena, which is a, a soul agreement of a spirit that's usually of a very high frequency to take over a body while the soul leaves. So the body does not die. There's a soul exchange, which is very different than a spirit attachment. Does it have a previous existence or previous history and body? It, if it has, it's accessible may not be human but it might come from a not a human dimension maybe an extraterrestrial for instance does it know about the other parts it can and will learn about them over time as part of what the therapy supports does it have an archetypal death experience it may have if it's had a body before and the purpose of a walk-in is to fulfill a purpose without having to go through the physical and psychological developmental stages 
and that needs in therapy for a walk-in consciousness is to support uh, integration and dealing with the transition. So in hypnotherapy practice, and certainly in past life therapy practice, when these aspects of consciousness show up as individual expressions of consciousness, it's super important that we know how to determine what this aspect is, why it's there, and what it needs for healing and wholeness in the work that we're doing. So I hope this that's helpful to you. And you're all going to get a copy of this if you um, have attended today. It's going to be part of our notes. So I'm going to move on to talk about the therapeutic skills that I think are necessary for us to do this work. I personally think doing spirit releasement work is one of the most sophisticated techniques that I use and know because it comes from so many different modalities and it integrates so many different layers of therapeutic skills. The first skill that we need is to have the capacity to move beyond our assumptions because in this work, we have to stay curious and open so that we can be in alignment with, with what the client's experience truly is and what they truly need. And not to assume that every person is gonna have an entity or that every person is going to wanna release an entity or that every being that you talk to as a part of the client's consciousness is an entity. So we have to stay curious and not make assumptions and ask the questions. Let the client tell us what's going on. We have good good um, grounding in all the questions. We can certainly sleuth it out with the client in a session. And we also need to have a good energetic and verbal rapport, not only with the client, but with the entity. And you, if any of you have done spirit releasement work, you will know that sometimes the entities will show up with very different personalities and energetic patterns than our clients have. And we're going to have to have the flexibility to get in alignment with them as if they're another client so that we can get the rapport to support them in doing the work. It's important to use open-ended language in all hypnotherapy sessions so that we are not inadvertently leading the client or creating embedded suggestions in the client. We need to have a really good understanding of what a near-death experience is and the map of that. Obviously, it's going to go beyond a near-death experience when you support the, the entity and in moving into the light, but we need to understand what the archetypal pattern of that is so that we can identify through the death in the past life whether or not it's made a complete transition into the light. Also, all the research and out-of-body experiences to understand that our consciousness is non-local. We do not have to be in a body to be aware. And for some clients, this is a big surprise because they don't have any direct experience of it consciously. And all of a sudden, they're talking about walking down a street in another body while they're also in their own body. So we can help help explain what that is for people when they are initiated into doing this type of more uh, quantum healing work. We need to have past life therapy skills, obviously, because most of the time we do spirit releasement as an adjunct to a past life regression. And Peter spent a good amount of time not only talking about channeling, but modeling channeling that will be happening in a session when you are communicating with the client's higher self and hopefully with the entity's higher self to get the information that you need to know how to support the releasement. And then the next one is working with spirit guides and knowing how to test the authenticity of the guides and whether or not they are there because they've been divinely assigned or they are psychically codependent and wanting to help, or just there because they're trying to get their needs met. Accessing the higher self is an important component of this work. Certainly as a practitioner, you wanna activate your higher self in the room, work as best you can from that place of your own consciousness, your own elevated awareness, work with the client and the entity's higher self as a co-therapist. It's super important to invoke the entity's higher self. It'll make it easier to do the work if you can depend on that purity of consciousness coming through as a support for the client's work of a releasement. And of course, good boundaries and, and protection tools are imperative for this work. So Peter's going to talk a little bit more about guides and helpers. Yeah. Um, I find it, it, it help us all around. Um, 
my my impression of of the and as, as I share with clients um, in a follow up session is that uh, we have spirit guides, angels, archangels, ascended masters, and um, others from the light. And so I encourage clients to think of it this way: um, to imagine that um, these uh, resources have a comfortable chair, a small desk, and a red phone. They're waiting for your call. They're bored. Give them something to do. They are here to serve us because um, that's what they do, but they can't serve us as much unless we ask for help. So during the session right up front, I, uh, I ask the client, are there any religious figures, saints, loved ones who've passed on, shamanic animals, guides you've heard about from psychics or anybody else, that when things go wrong in your life, you turn to them for support. Some people have them, some don't. So I then, um, the client may say, yes, I have a, um, a bear that's a spirit guide and my grandmother and um, Kuan Yin. So as part of, at the very beginning of the session, I invite those resources to join us before we go into hypnosis, along with all of your other masters and teachers and guides, whether you know them or not. And you let me know when they've arrived. Um, and so you'll know, along with my own guidance. So I'll ask, have they arrived? And the client will say, sure, of course they have, in the client's imagination. Great. So then I'll step forward again and say, thank you all for joining us today. We'd like your help in allowing, assisting Alice to do this, 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 and this. Whatever she put on her initial form or whatever we've, and whatever we've talked about uh, that she'd like to focus on during the session. I then invite the client to take those goals into their heart and feel them strongly in their heart of what success looks like for our session and send them out like a silent prayer to all those who joined us from the light asking for their assistance. And we've done that, follow that up with a silent prayer of gratitude. Because as you know, it's all about gratitude. And from my perspective, <laughs> what I'm seeking to do is to, um, to uh, create everybody joining us in as a group to therefore begin to work with both of us during the session through first thought, first feeling, first image, first voice. And in the midst of the session, if I'm realizing that, oh my gosh, the client is feeling unsure because I'm making sure they feel safe at every step along the way, I will then, I then uh, beginning the session, completely fill them with, with white crystal and light and then invite that light to fill up their entire aura so right up front, they are completely filled with this crystal and white light. And then um, as we begin to go up into the light, if they're feeling fearful in any way, we bring in Archangel Michael and ask him to stand in front of, behind, on either side of, above and below the client so that he's completely surrounding them with his energy. We then surround the two of them with a circle of fire then we invite the white light of love, the green light of healing, and the purple light of divine guidance to be another layer of protection. And if appropriate, then call upon Master Jesus to bring in the uh, liquid gold to pour over all of this. Because again, that's another way to make sure that the client is feeling safe. And I'll check with the client along the way, how does that feel? And the client will say, I hope by this time, pretty good. <laughs> and then we begin the session. Uh, by taking them into trance and up into the light. So that's what I'm doing to um, call upon the assistance of the light because they keep showing up and gratitude is key for all of us in this process. Anything to add from your perspective? Well, I was going to talk a little bit about some of the anomalies that can show up in, in the sessions. Um, and these anomalies are not that common, but they do show up. And the wonderful thing about this work is if you do it over time, you'll see there is a very predictable pattern most of the time. Right. Most of the responses that of the questions you ask will definitely be in a pattern that will affirm that this really there is really something to this because all the psyches are having similar experiences. Mm -hmm. So one of the anomalies, because I'm working directly with the, the entity and having them talk through the client to me, is the entity won't talk. 
It just refuses to talk. It's mute or it isn't going to go there. That's when telepathy and working with the higher self as an intermediary between the entity and the client or the client, higher self and me to support some information coming through so we can know how to support the process. And sometimes you discover that the entity is deaf or dumb. So the higher self is really the only way they can communicate or the entity is a pre-verbal child. So the higher self is, is always the place that will uh, be the saving grace in just about any situation when you do this work. Yeah. What if the entity won't go? It refuses to leave. Well, that is where your therapeutic skills come in because at that point, you will need to dialogue with the entity to discover what its needs are that are keeping it stuck. Mm -hmm. There's some unfinished business Maybe they are terrified of going to the light because they think they're going to go to hell. Maybe they are filled with shame and regret and are self-punishing by, by torturing themselves. Maybe there is a karmic connection between the entity and your client's past life where they're trying to work out some kind of karmic pattern that's not complete. Maybe they're terrified of being punished. Uh, maybe they're still hanging around because they're addicted. There is always some reason, some need that they're trying to fulfill by hanging on and hanging out. So the therapeutic work at that point, the entity becomes your client. You're going to do therapy with the, with the entity. And hopefully with the higher self-support um, of all concerned, you will find out what needs to be resolved. And you can work with that resolution as you would with any client in therapy. Sometimes the client is attached to the entity rather than the entity being attached to the client. And I've heard people make comments like, ever since my mother died, I just can't let go of her. So the entity is actually the client with the body holding on to the mother spirit. So that's a possibility for some grief work and some resolution work and some voice dialogue work between your client and whoever they're holding here out of their own grief or unfinished business. And sometimes, um, I guess I've made that comment already. Okay, so one of, one of the things that um, I'm going to kind of contrast a little bit to what, what Peter shared with you by, by giving you a different diagram of a spirit releasement process that I learned through Bill Baldwin, Edith Fiore, and Irene Hickman, which is more of an interactive process working with the voice dialogue between the client and the entity and the therapist. And here is a diagram that I created. I'll do another share screen that I work with my students when I introduce spirit releasement therapy as a diagram of the different stages of doing a spirit releasement. And for, for all of you, you'll have access to an actual recording of a spirit releasement it's a process you can do for yourself. I'll give you the um, information for how to access that off my website. And I'll be sending this diagram with along with the notes that Peter and I are putting together for you. So this model is based on the tarot deck card of the, the tower. The tower is a transformational card that has to do with with healing and um, alchemical process of change and evolution. And it starts at the bottom with the interview. And Peter did an excellent job of outlining some of the symptoms that are related to a spirit attachment. And in any interview, you probably are going to be aware of symptoms that people share that could potentially turn into a spirit releasement session. So you're just paying aware awareness to what they're talking about, what the issues are. And if you decide together that it would be appropriate to do a scan to determine whether or not there is an entity attachment, you would move from the interview into the education about how it works and why it works and what the client's role is and what your role is, answer any questions, and then invite the client to close his or her eyes and to do an energetic scan through their whole physical body and in the energy field around their body. And as they're scanning, whether they see it, feel it, smell it, taste it, or just imagine it, they're looking for sensing any energy space in or around them where there's density, stickiness, stuck, stuckness, darkness, fuzziness, smokiness, 
coagulation, anything that in any way seems to be distinctly separate from the rest of their energy sphere. And every person I've ever worked with can do this. And while they're, while they're talking about what they're perceiving, I'm taking notes and writing down all the areas that are problematic for us to explore. And after they do that, I ask them where in their experience is there the most problematic area? And they always pick one that we start with. We go into that area of the body, psychically, intuitively, and I ask them, if this energy could speak to you now, what would it want to say after invoking the higher self of both the client and the entity? And that is our entry point. Typically, a phrase that will be spoken will be something like, get me out of here. I don't want to talk to you. Leave me alone. I'm not going. They'll say things like that that are very much an indicator that there's some kind of distress going on. So from that point on, it's a process of dialoguing. It's a process of asking systematic questions, trying to identify what's there, who's on first, trying to find out when it came to be with the client, how old the client was. And you ask the question like that, how old was the client? Because the entities don't have a sense of time. If you ask them how long they've been there, they don't really have a way to register that. So how old was Susie when you first entered her? Where was she? What was happening that gave you the opening? And why did you choose her? Why her? So you find out what the circumstance were of the entrance of the, of the entity or an entity can actually move into the body and attach very, very distinctly, or it can just hang around. Often people will describe things around their energy field that they're aware of, and they're not fully attached, but they're hovering and having an influence for sure. And then find out what happened to the entity. What was its last memory before it joined your client? Where was it? What happened to it? Many times they do not realize they're dead. If they died suddenly and they don't have a belief in the afterlife and they're just hanging out and confused, they're looking for some place to land, as Peter described. They need to have some place to have some warmth and some connection and maybe have their addictive needs met or their emotional needs met through having a connection with someone. So you find out what the story is of the entity. You help it realize it's dead if, if it doesn't realize it and ask it how it's affecting the client. In what ways are you affecting Susie? What do you get by being here with Susie? Well, I get her to drink, or I get to feel safe, or I protect her. What do you protect her from? I protect her so she doesn't go through what I went through. Or maybe the entity says, I'm here because she called for help. Often entities will come in when children are being abused in some way, and the child is calling for help. And the entities think they're there helping. They're resonating with the pain and the process that the kid's going through because they've been there and they may help for a little while. But as the client matures into their full adult self, it's, an, it's a drain on the energy system. So you go through the whole story of why they're there, how they're affecting, what they need. And at some point, you can do a dialogue between the client and the entity so the client can share Susie can share how she feels about this entity being there and ask it to go if that's what she wants. And we talk to the entity about someone that they loved who could come and help them from the light. And if they don't have anybody, we call angelic beings or guides and helpers from the light. We test the guides to make sure they are actually authentically from the light. One of the ways you test is through the declaration that Peter shared. Another way is by asking the client to describe the quality of the energy and the color around the guide. And you can also ask the entity to reach its hand out and touch the guide and tell us what it feels like. And if it's a guide of light, it will feel welcoming, loving, gentle, sweet, relieving. If it's not of the light and starts to pull on it or it feels in any way negative, you bless it into the light and send it out of the sphere. And this is where helpers and guides can come in. Like you can have a uh, warrior angel standing against the darkness. You can call in St. Michael. You can call in Kuan Yin. Any entities that the client or entity would work with, any helpers would be appropriate to call in for support to make sure that the sphere of energy that you're working in is not contaminated by any intrusive energies. And once the entity has made contact with a guide of light, 
they start to soften. They start to feel the love. They start to feel the shift within themselves. And it's usually just, just a couple breaths and they're able to move on to progression. But you always work with guides because if you release an entity into the energy field and they don't go, there's a possibility that that entity will attach to someone else. So I personally believe that if we're going to do spirit releasement work, we have a karmic responsibility, not only for our client, but for the entity to make sure that it has a way to get where it needs to go, just as we're supporting our client have a way to go where, where they want to go. So that transition into the light is a really important part of it. Make sure that they are contained. Peter was talking about putting webs of light around them. If they don't want to go, that's one way to support them in softening is to put that light around them and let them sit there and marinate for a while in that light. Any fear that they have will start to quell. I've had experiences where entities have refused to go and we keep them in that light so they're contained. They can no longer have the effect on the client because they're being held in that, in that container of light. And then the next time I see the client, either the entity's already gone with guides that we've asked to watch and help, or we do the releasement because the entity has softened enough that it's ready to go because it's not getting its needs met there anymore the way it was. And that releasement to the light, um, making sure that that portal into the light seals to hold the entity there. And then there is, and also there maybe needed to be some goodbyes and some dialogue back and forth between the client and the entity so that they can feel complete. And then after the entity's released and gone, there's a sealing protection meditation of accessing the light within, like a sun, filling the body with light, reclaiming the light as its own sovereignty and filling the space around to heal any rips, seal any, any holes in the auric field. Mm -hmm. And that sealing meditation is something that I ask the client to do on a fairly regular basis the first few days, maybe the week after doing the releasement. So mm -hmm. there can be a... Um, a new homeostasis established in their energy system. The after care is just as important. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this now as well, um, how to support a person after having a spirit releasement and to uh, make suggestions of self-care. After a releasement, I usually just sit quietly with the client and ask that they share with me anything they want about the experience that wasn't communicated when they were in, in the process. So I'll just give them some space to talk, communicate, and then I will suggest that they work with that healing light process in an ongoing way. And I give them water. If I'm in person, I ask them to get water if they don't have it close by and maybe do some grounding um, and suggest that they give themselves some quiet time and some space just to integrate their experience and to slowly get back into activity. For some people, it is a dramatic shift of energy, and it does take time to reacclimate to their own integrity and their own energetic patterns because it's been interfered with for, in some cases, for a long time. I also either do hands on Reiki if in person and do remote Reiki to support uh, the client in those last parts of the session and suggest that they do some walking in nature, they rest, maybe get a massage, uh, just do nurturing self-care as they, as they um, integrate. I suggest that clients continue to process and to reflect on the experience because often there'll be a lot of connections that they make, the synchronicities about their experiences that they weren't initially aware of and to let them know that there may be more information that comes through as they integrate and to watch the symptoms that they had before the uh, attachment was released to see if they still have any symptoms or if they've changed in any way. I also let them know that once once a or more entity has been released, they may be more sensitive and aware of other levels of intrusive energies that they had not been aware of before. So there may be a need to come back and do other sessions to release other layers of entities. And that their work now is to strengthen their energetic boundaries and their physical body boundaries and their psychological boundaries. People who have codependency issues, especially those of us who are people helpers, 
have a high potential for picking up entities because we are so open and caring. And sometimes we work harder than our clients do because of that. And that creates a vulnerability. So we as people helpers are um, need to be responsible for our own energy hygiene just as much as we are helping our clients. I like to do a a little checkup on myself occasionally, just doing the scan on myself to see if I've accrued any entities in my work. And I often need to do some spirit releasement on myself. So it's a good way to do your own energy hygiene and stay, stay clear for yourself. Um, Peter and I were going to talk a little bit about the pros and cons of these different styles of doing the uh, spirit releasement work. And for me, the immediacy of working directly with the client is very fulfilling for me and the client because they are directly participating in the dialoguing and can directly feel and trust what's happening since it's coming through them directly. Um, and it really supports a sense of consciousness expansion by doing this work, obviously, because the paradigm of what is real and who are we as spiritual beings and human bodies um, is more clarified by doing this work. But some of the cons for this technique that I use come when people are too young to do their own work, the children, or they're too ill to focus, or um, they have a psychotic process going on and can't follow instructions or stay with it. So the kind of technique that, that you learned from Peter today might be really more efficient and more effective for those types of clients. There are also other shamanic approaches and dousing approaches and approaches that are just simply using prayer to do spirit releasement because there's it's not a new thing. It's been going on since people were drumming and sitting around the fires. On some level, there's been some spirit releasement processes through all traditions spiritually. And I also wanted just to um, give you a, a bibliography of some books that might be helpful. I've, I will include that in the notes. Certainly, the Spirit Releasement book by Bill Baldwin is a Bible for any of us doing this work. Uh, and then the Remote Spirit Releasement book by Irene Hickman, who also uses the same technique in a remote fashion. And a more recent book called Spirit Release by Sue Allen, I highly recommend. It actually goes beyond what Bill Baldwin has written about because she works with curses and voodoo and some of the more out there esoteric approaches to um, curses to help to help practitioners know how to work in those areas. And then of course, The Unquiet Dead by Edith Fiore is a, a basic primer for both clients and hypnotherapists, house life therapists. And another book that I'm not sure everybody's read, but I think is fascinating is called 30 Years Among the Dead by Carl Wickland. It's a very old book, but he is a spirit releaser MD who would bring spirits home from working on cadavers with medical students and he and his wife after dinner with her uh, mediumistic abilities would take these these beings to the light who were hanging out around their bodies when he was doing the the physiology classes on cadavers and uh, he did that for 30 years and then finally if you're interested in some scripts in my spiritual hypnotherapy scripts book I have a script specifically for doing spirit releasement. And I also have a CD that anyone can access on my website and download. This is a, a spirit releasement and a talking with the dead process for self-hypnosis if anybody wants to get their toes in and do some work on themselves safely. Okay, so pros and cons from you. Well, I'd like to first mention in terms of a resource, uh, Greg McHugh's book, because I find that to be the best book I've seen out there today, from my perspective, and Greg's on the call today, um, the new regression therapy, healing the wounds and tra trauma of this life and past lives with the presence and the light of the divine. And I think Greg's approach is terrific. Um, and I invite all of you to purchase a book, <laughs> one of, it, of this particular book, because it's a, it's a great resource to, to, to help in the process. Um, and I also find that for some of the clients, um, spirit releasement may not work because it's part of their soul's journey to have this particular challenge. Um, and especially for those cases that are especially uh, complex, 
Um, I've worked with Andy Tomlinson, who some of you know, who's been on the calls and has presented uh, at IBART uh, at these gatherings. And he's a, an, a master in spirit releasement. And uh, Andy is, and I have both talked about how in some cases, it's we can't do anything. It's part of the soul's journey for that particular client. Um, and so to realize that you cannot, um, you may enter as a therapist to assist them, but not much may change or they're not ready to change for whatever reason. Uh, because spirit releasement is a rather metaphysical approach. And I know that for some of my clients, um, they're not into this at all. And therefore, if you don't believe in it or are not open to it, then not much is gonna change. So that's why with, with all of my clients, I spend a good 30 to 45 minutes right up front for a free consultation by Zoom or phone or Skype or in person where the client can share with me what their, their issues are. And then I can talk about hypnosis, how it works, and then my particular approach that I've outlined to you very uh, in great detail today, but I share this with them briefly to give them a sense that uh, if this is a match for them, great. If it's not a match for them, great. So I just invite you to take a look at what um, Holly has mentioned in terms of resources, because I've, I, I know of all of them that she's mentioned and think very highly of them. I just think that Greg's book is up to date in terms of ways that can help um, each of you present um, learn what I consider to be a very spiritual approach that is um, can be quite successful. So. I think we're ready for questions now. We are. So everybody can come back on screen with your um, mics off uh, on if you wanna share and ask questions. I have a question. Um, okay, Julia. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for this amazing discussion. I learned a lot. <laughs> it was really wonderful. And um, I have my question is about um, um, what would you recommend to strengthen auric field or energetic field? What are the best ways? What can we do? Uh, do you want to take that or I'll take it? When you said trans, you said trans. Wait, can I can I interrupt for one second, Holly? Are we recording the questions? Yes. Okay. Is that okay with everybody if we record the questions? Okay. Uh, say your question again, Julia. I'm not sure I understood. Transcend. Uh, how we can uh, protect or strengthen our field, energetic field. You want me to respond, Peter? Yeah, why don't you, why don't you respond? Okay. Right. Well, one of the things would be helpful to know is what what is compromising our energetic field. Is it our belief system? Is it that we're in toxic environments? Is it that we are um, codependent? All of those things can contribute to a weakened boundary system. So to to get with somebody who can help you really survey what's going on with your energy system and how you are unconsciously weakening it or compromising it, maybe unknowingly doing so. And then there are techniques for creating more resilient. Um, I work with this rainbow bridge work as a way to clear my energy, keep it, keep energy hygiene going on a regular basis. Um, people do yoga, people do exercise, people do nutrition, better sleep. I mean, anything that's going to promote your well-being and health overall. Mm -hmm. And to look at in what ways you compromise yourself psychologically and emotionally, you know, for instance, taking on people's problems, feeling like it's your responsibility when it's not. Um, all that's going to contribute one way or the other to either a healthy, strong, resilient system or one that's compromised. Mm -hmm. so it's not an easy answer everybody's different if, if, if i could add i'll be happy to include in the enclosures today in the uh, material that's being sent out an aura strengthening visualization that bill baldwin uh, suggested in his book and i give it to all my clients basically it's filling yourself with white crystal and light and filling up your aura with that same light and making it stronger stronger and so on because doing this daily or several times a day can in fact be 
help to keep you safe. And you don't have to do every step of it after you've done it a few times step by step, but just intend it to be around you as a shield protecting you uh, to keep you safe. But I'll, I'll include that. And one other thing that I use is I, I have um, done some studies of angel magic and there's a book called Psychic Protection that I've worked with, which, which aligns you with four specific angels for protection on site whenever you need it. You call on these angels that stand behind you and in front of you to create a boundary of protection from angelic angelic energy. Mm -hmm. so there's all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And everybody has to find what works for them. Holly, yeah. did you um are you going to include that rainbow um blessing in the notes? I can. I can. The book, is, the book is out of print. The last I looked, the, the books are like a hundred dollars if you can find them. So I, I will uh, include the, the little prayer I said in that boundary. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I, like I have it. a question. Um, the first thing that came to mind was, don't clients freak out at the suggestion that they have an entity sometimes? Well, I don't make a suggestion they have an entity. I, I, I don't use that terminology. I talk about some some kind of an energetic blockage or intrusive energy that needs to be addressed. They can call it what they want. But yeah, if, if a client comes in and thinks they've got a entity and they're familiar with the exorcist movie, they're they're frightened. So part of our job is to normalize it. How well, does one normalize such a thing? Well, it, I talk about my 40 years being a hypnotherapist and how it shows up commonly and that it's a, a process that is easily handled for the most part. And you use the word entity? Well, it depends on the client. It okay, because there are certain clients who will completely freak out if you do that. It's called an energetic overlay. Yeah. And you can neutralize the terms. Peter, what do you think? And for me, I don't mention this at all up front. Um, I, instead, we're, we're now up in the light where the, the client is very safe, protected by all those from the light. And we're inviting through voice dialogue, the energy, whatever is present to come forth, the words like, I'm here. Are you a part of Alice or something else? And I see it, I uh, view it as an intruder energy. Just that's all it is. So we don't get into exorcism or whatever. It's just an intruder energy. And so then as a follow-up to the session, after we have released it and sent it into the light, I include a, a handout with uh, 10 handouts that I send to the client that talks about earthbound spirits, negative entities, and the like, to give them some more background as to what it was that we released after the fact, because talking about it up front will only upset them. And it's not, you know, let's let's get rid of it. And then we'll and then I get together a week later with the client for a follow up session where we talk about what happened with me going through my notes, taking them step by step through the session, describing what I was doing and why and underscoring in great detail the difference between an earthbound spirit and negative entity and other intruders. So that by that time, things are much better and there's not really ever a problem um, involving fearfulness um, at this particular point in time after the fact. And sometimes people are already terrified because they're having these experiences that they think they're crazy because they're having voices or they're having behaviors that they don't have control over. And when you talk to them about this paradigm, they start to feel relieved that there's some way out of it. So mm -hmm. it just depends on the client. You know, and what they're dealing with and what their paradigms are. And just as with any client, we're going to try to, to meet them where they are, you know, to have that rapport and that respect and then help them get where they want to go. And the kind of language you would use, the kind of intro you give is going to depend on what the clients bring into the table. I once had a client that under hypnosis, her tongue emerged from her mouth and it was about six inches. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I didn't address it at the time because I didn't, she was very naive and very in denial. And uh, maybe it was a mistake on my behalf, but I never addressed it. 
Was she aware of that? I, I, I didn't address it. There was so much going on and she was so terrified. I didn't address it. And frankly, I was frightened. Mm -hmm. I understand it that. was a pretty scary thing. And at the time of the session, my dog was on the way on the other side of my home, which uh, I did with my dog because I didn't want the dog picking up negativity. And the dog was traumatized for weeks afterwards, even though she was not present in the room. Well, that would probably be a representation of a full possession. That's what I suspected. Yeah. But the client was very, very naive, very in denial. Also could be a multiple personality. That makes a tongue stick out like that. Well, there can be, there can be psycho spiritual phenomena with any of these clients who have entities. So that's sort of a paranormal experience. I worked with a gentleman who was referred to me by a Catholic priest who was claimed to be a multiple personality because when he was a child in this particular religious organization, they would do rituals, putting him in the center of, of a circle and telling him the devil was in him. Oh my God. It was terribly abusive. This this man had a terribly abusive background. It was probably was a satanic a, cult that did that. In a church, oh. in a well-known church. Oh. And the Catholic Church would not work with him because they have very strong criteria that has to show demonic possession, although he had symptoms that look like demonic possession. And I was very new at doing spirit releasement at that time. And when he sat in my office, his eyes turned red. Wow. And he started to levitate. His body was doing this on the chair right in front of me. God. And oh. I was terrified. But I had just had a class with Edith Fiore. I was a brand new spirit releaser. And I just called in everything I possibly could. We worked for two hours and the entity left. Wow. And that man's life completely changed. He was living in his car. He paid the last $75 he had to me for the session. And his life completely changed because of that. He got he got a job. He got healthy. He got, you know, a relationship. I ended up actually performing a wedding ceremony for him and his bride. His whole life changed after re this releasement. And he would, for years, when I would go give public presentations on this, he would accompany me and tell his story about what happened to him. Really profound. But boy, was I scared. It was such a new thing for me. And he was my initiation to, to, to realize it comes from love, not fear. And I'm not afraid anymore. Because if I could face that and survive that, I know, you know, I'm supposed to be doing this work. So yeah. if I could add something here, what I find is that for those who are new to this, who are interested, um, read the information that is being shared today and um, books or whatever on it. But as you ask for clients, most likely you're gonna be finding clients who are easy to work with. You're not gonna be getting those who are way off, way off the charts when it comes to uh, negative entities or whatever. They're more garden variety earthbound spirits that need help. So that trust that your guidance knows your level of expertise and is here to support you and help you practice with easy clients or clients that are pretty by the book where you can gain some, some uh, experience and confidence, and then occasionally you'll get one that's out of the water. Well, fine, just deal with it the best you can, but it's also an opportunity for you to stretch yourself a little bit, but constantly ask for help, internally or externally, <laughs> uh, because help is all around, and they're eager for you to play this role if you're willing to do so, because so many people have these intruder energies present, and it's time to help them um, be released from them. And how many people have entities that are not being supported correctly because of the lack of, of awareness in the therapists? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. and, and at least you all have the awareness now. So if it shows up, you can at least, if you don't want to do it, at least get them to someone who can support them. I think a high amount of people who are being diagnosed, you know, with mental illness are yeah. dealing with entities. Agreed. Send them to me. I don't know. Happy to work with them. Susan, 
Yeah, I have a question for you, Peter. You brought up, and I've heard this before, that these entities or these energies do not need our permission. But with the idea of free will, I'm really curious of your perspective on this. Well, we, we have Earth is a free will zone, one of the few places in the galaxy that's free will. We come here to practice making choices. Um, but one of the choices can be uh, that you need to experience every aspect of what it is to be human. And so this is a way for you in this particular lifetime to have challenges that need to be or can be overcome or resolved or whatever using hypnosis. And I find that um, it could be part of your soul's path to deal with these issues or not deal with them. Um, sometimes karma is involved, sometimes not. But by constantly asking for help, what I find is that clients will get the help they need eventually, we hope. And that's why I'm eager to spread the word about this um, because it's the uh, protocol is fairly easy to follow and it's typically easy to do. And the client immediately feels better. And those years of talk therapy that didn't even reach this level of, of assistance in the one, two hour session is amazing. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I just want to mention that Scott Peck who wrote The Road Less Traveled He's very into exorcism and spirit releasement. Mm, and, and I think he was a psychiatrist, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. He has yeah, heard the book, but yeah, thank you. One of the problems I have with, quote, exorcism from the church's perspective, at least as I understand it, is that you're perhaps getting rid of the energy from that individual, but you're not sending it into the light. You're just getting rid of it, and it can easily go and glom onto somebody else and come back or come back exactly and that can happen as well you need to keep your guards up so and it's it not therapeutic it's very aggressive <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't want to do anything that's going to cause harm to the client right keep the client safe yeah that's got to be a priority and and feeling safe yeah not threatened Other questions or comments? So I'd like to go back to uh, Julia's question about how to strengthen the aura or your energy field. I sent you a chat, but I don't see a response. Um, especially when working with spirit attachments, I use a Tibetan singing bowl. So before the client comes in, I have already uh, worked the space of the office to set the vibration, the frequency that's uh, right for me. And then I also uh, bring it right around my head, uh, mostly, uh, but I do my whole body. And then uh, sometimes when the client is in the recliner, I actually use the Tibetan bowl in their energy field. Yep. Yep. To make spirits uh, leave? Uh, no, it's a way of raising the vibration for the work that I'm going to be doing with them. Oh, to prepare them. Yeah, and but you can also use it with the uh, entities because it's a, a loving vibration frequency. I've had the Tibetan bowl for oh, probably 25 years. So it, um, you know, I, I know the, the sound when I go to into my office because it's a shared space. And if something is off, then I know to, you know, use my my bowl and get it to where I like it to be. Uh, and also about if there's a concern of having someone show up in your office and you're not ready for it. One very good way of doing that is to say to spirit in the universe, which is bring to me the people who are meant to come to me, the people who I can help. And if there's someone else who can help them, let them find that person. Ask for your ideal clients. <laughs> Ask those from the light to send them to you. And they will. Yep. And in my first few months, I had the red eyes and deformed hands and the energy coming right at me. 
And as soon as the client left, I, you know, reached out for my trainer and he said, I've never seen anything like that. Can't help you. <laughs> uh, but I had asked to bring to me what I can, yeah. what I'm ready for. And, you know, I, I'm a crisis manager. So that was right on. And my colleagues are going to refer to me, people with spirit releasement, or if they think it's a depossession. But I, I also think that it, that we need to be careful not to use get rid of. Right. In right. my opinion, that comes from a place of fear. It's we're releasing to the love of the universe. Mm -hmm. Um, you mentioned before the higher self of the entity. So do demons have higher selves? Uh, uh, Holly, you who are you asking? What I've experienced is they have a higher self that they've renounced, and that's what evil is. We all come from the light. We all come from the same source. And as... Peter was talking about we're in this dimension of duality. So we've got good and bad and we have choice. We have free will and some beings choose their ego over their higher self. And when I've done spirit release, but with really, really dark entities, it's always a process of helping them remember their divine connection to source. That's what heals them. That's what turns them around and helps them take the free will choice to move on. So, yeah, I think we all have higher selves. So if I could add to that, one of the other tools that you can use is invite that the dark entity to look within themselves. What is at the very center of your being? And just describe it to me. Oh, anger. Go into the anger, mm -hmm. hatred. Go into the anger even more deeply into those negative emotions that they're feeling because as they go deeper and deeper within themselves, eventually they're most likely going to see a, a little candle, a light. And when they begin to say, I see there's a light there. Well, focus on that light. Make it bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger. Because what happens is that inevitably the light grows and it will grow bigger and stronger and take them over so that they become light beings again. And therefore, you don't need to send them into the light. They're already returning to the light themselves that was within them all the time. So that see that as a, an additional uh, tool to use um, when you are faced with what should I do next? <laughs> Try that. What a metaphor this work is for what's going on on the planet right now. What a metaphor is it for dealing with the shadow work within all of us so that we can come to our own source of light more clearly. It's really hard to do that when we're la laden with other energetic patterns that we have to process along with our own. So I think the spirit releasement work is really apropos for where we are evolutionarily as and, a part of our healing. And you could also perhaps uh, make the connection of those uh, lone shooters or whatever, or the you know the, those um, all the negativity, all the violence that's going on. Often it is because of I believe negative entities are attached to that person, and. It's not part of our, our um, talk therapy approach, but that's what's really going on. And no wonder they're acting irrationally. Yeah. Georgina, you had your hand up a while ago. Do you want to share something? You're we muted. Don't... You're on mute. Sound at the bottom on the left. <clears throat> yeah. There you go. I was going to mention that um, when I was uh, teaching uh, how to do this many years ago, quite a few years ago, one of the people in my class had come from a local TV station. And uh, one of the things I asked her to do uh, at that Dutch shows how long ago it was, I was recording it on a disc so that they could all have a disc to take home to, to remind them of, of the teaching and so she set up the camera and everything and she was going to make copies she was going to take it back she worked in the in the editing suite of the newsroom of uh, ctv and she was going to take it back and during the uh session i asked for volunteers and a young man came up and he uh said he'd just come back from Haiti. And since he'd come back from Haiti, 
was feeling off and he didn't know what was wrong and he was just, you know, feeling not well. So put him into hypnosis and I also lit a candle so that the candle was also always on screen just at the corner. And um, he started to growl and bare his teeth and his eyes rolled back and you could hear the class go <gasps> and then suddenly the candle went <laughs> and split in half. And <laughs> I said, oh, stop it. I mean, it, it, I sort of just used my irritable voice. Oh, stop it. Come on, stop it. Who are you? And what I did was remind it after much discourse back and forth was remind the entity, as you were saying, Peter, that we are all from the light. And remember, you once were light. And one of the reasons you're so upset and angry is that you maybe feel lost yourself. So you're doing that to other people. I don't know this because he started getting irritable and growl. He really was growling like, Rah! right? And then his eyes were rolling back and my glass was breaking out. And uh, but I sort of found it funny, actually. No, I didn't laugh at him, but I just found it like amusing. Oh, you know, it was so silly sort of thing. And eventually I managed to get him to go inside just, just for a moment. You don't you can come back anytime you like, just for a moment. Go inside and see, just have a look and see if you can see a spark of light inside you, because that it was your beginning. And we all have a beginning. So don't you wonder sometimes what your beginning was? So let's see if we can find your beginning. And that working with that entity that way changed him now the rest of the story is this she took the disc back to the editing suite at ctv um it crashed all of the editing uh equipment and could she couldn't get anything not only that but she she got into trouble for doing that because she wasn't supposed to bring outside mm -hmm. stuff in but everything crashed it just wouldn't respond not only wouldn't respond but it it ruined the equipment they eventually got it back but it crashed all the equipment in the editing suite for the newsroom so there's no question that negative energy is real but it's like anything it's as real as we give it power oh, yes. i think when we say oh come on come on come on no, I, I know that's how you're feeling right now. Just like we do any client. I know that's how you're feeling right now. But I tell you what, you are more than you seem. You are so much more than you seem. You come from light like we all do. Now, yeah, don't, don't get angry with me. I'm telling you. <laughs> and, and it worked. But it was really funny how the candle went... <laughs> And the, it just split right in half. Yeah. And everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine the class. Yeah. Hmm. So that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad you don't have a recording of it. Yeah, well, no, there was a recording of nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, Yuki has her hand up. Yeah, hello. Um, thank you all. That was wonderful. Uh, and I really learned a lot. Um, my question is, I have come across every now and then an energy or entity that does not wish to communicate at all, no matter how I uh, try to lure it into, well, when did you come into this client's life? What do you want from her? They just will not answer at all. Um, do you have any suggestions how to get that energy to communicate? One possibility would be to ask the higher self, of the individual to come forth and, and the heart as well, as I mentioned earlier, and to have the three of you talk about what they suggest could happen to get the energy to talk um, as one way of getting more background as to what's going on. Um, 
or asking for beings of light to join you from, you know, from Archangel Michael, et cetera. What, what wants to happen to encourage this energy to speak? Okay. But isn't it also indicative in a way, um, I, I think sometimes uh, people, my clients may have an attachment uh, to that energy and um, they almost define themselves uh, through how much power this energy has over them. And so it may be that the client, her, him or herself, may be very reluctant to let go, even though they come here and say, hey, free me from this, you know? So move on, because this isn't, you know, you, you can't heal everybody. And that's a difficult lesson to learn. But we're all in our own story. We're all on our own journey. And right up front, that's why I spend time in this consultation to talk more about what their issues are and find out how they, if they really want to change, because I can't make anybody change. I don't have that power, but right. they themselves can. And if I may add one thing that I'm also curious about, um, I've been doing this work for a long time, and I often wonder about the intersection of um, the spiritual and the psychological. So in other words, um, you know, a doctor, a psychologist, psychotherapist might diagnose, diagnose somebody as, I don't know, schizophrenic or whatnot. And um, yet there is such a strong spiritual aspect to it. So um, I, I sometimes wonder, uh, how can there be a better integration of, let's say, th psychotherapy and our work, which is, to some therapists, it's considered fringe, uh, sadly. And so um, is there a way of bringing those two together more? I think it's happening. You know, there's a whole movement in the therapy world now to use medicine-assisted uh, therapies. Canada, medicine, ayahuasca, uh, and there's a whole movement. I in my community in the Bay Area, I know a lot of therapists who've being trained in this right now that are starting to integrate that. And once we start to integrate all that we know about consciousness and transpersonal psychology in the medical field, things are going to start to change. It's the medical field that has to get indoctrinated to this. And I just I, I, I just ask that we stay within our boundaries of training. Yeah. That we don't pretend we know stuff that we don't know. Absolutely. Yep. And there are whole programs that are just transpersonally oriented. My my background is in transpersonal master's degree. Yeah. So it was it was geared towards the consciousness movement and and uh, spirituality. And Ibart's new book that just came out, talking about past life regression, is just another step in that direction, trying to, to educate the public and those therapists out there who are open to this, that in fact, this approach can be very, very effective and create results rather quickly, depending upon the client. The work that all of you are doing right now is a part of that transition. I mean, you're part of it. Thank you. Just have to be cognizant not to get in the way of people who are seriously emotionally or mentally ill. Right. Yeah. Not unless you're trained to work with them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And to go back to your, your comment about who how you reach someone who um didn't want to speak. Uh I would move into parts therapy and ask that silent part. If there's any part of them that has a voice, mm. Mm -hmm. that's why I, it's refusing or it doesn't want to speak. No, I do. I wouldn't ask that. I wouldn't even use, say the words refusing. I said it. I would just say, is there any part of you, at the moment, that silent part of you, that would like to speak? Mm -hmm. And if they say no, good. Is there a part of you that would like to communicate in a different way? Maybe write it down. Mm -hmm. No. Is there a part of you would like to communicate at all? Yes. Then tell me how or no. Well, then I guess for now, you're just happy being the way you are. Is that correct? So, you know. Yeah. You have to work with what is. You cannot force anything. 
I have a question about past lives. I've run into uh, past life situations where the client did something, quote, very bad or evil, mm -hmm. and they are very, very reluctant to remember it. They get stuck and, and it doesn't continue because they can't confront something, quote, bad that they did. Mm -hmm. So they get completely stuck and blank. Mm -hmm. What do you do in a case like that? Well, I'll tell you what I do. And that is, I tell them, isn't that great? It's done. It's over. That part of you is complete. And so let's spend some time forgiving that part of you. And then we can look at what else you're going to do to balance it off in your current life. In, in this case, the client never got to that part that she needed to forgive herself. She couldn't confront it. She couldn't face it. She drew a blank and it, it didn't budge after that. Well, if it didn't budge, it didn't budge. I had a client who was a, um, a guard in the concentration camps and did awful, awful, awful things. This is a guy, I was working with a guy for, in, when I was doing work in New York and uh, he just was beside himself because that was his past life. And he came to me because he didn't know what to do with that memory because he'd just gone to a, a past life regression therapist and he discovered the memory, but it, nobody told him what to do with that. It, he was left with it. And um, so I said, well, let's celebrate it because that part of you is done because we're all made of so many parts and that part of you is done. So let's do some forgiveness around that part and understand it had a role to play. So tell me, what are you doing today with your current life? Well, what was he doing today? He was finding homes for the guys living on the street with AIDS. That was his job. He was a social worker. I said, what does that tell you? I mean, you know, so it, it yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's always a way in. Yeah. If the client wants, the client doesn't want, they don't want. Joanne, we can't hear you. I just want to add to that, that when I get, when I have people that are facing things like that, I also remind them in the broad way of this, the arc of social evolution, that we are the people who were alive thousands of years ago during times when everyone was acting barbaric. And I think if you can wrap somebody's individual experience around that arc uh, or within that arc, it, 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 it can alleviate the pressure. Just, just yesterday, I was listening to a podcast and the person made a point of saying that 250 years ago, people would pack a picnic for their family and go out on and watch beheadings. And that was a really common thing. Uh, and that was too I mean, just to be reminded that 250 years ago, that's the kind of thing that a lot of people would do. And Watch here we are. Witches get burnt at the stake. Exactly. Exactly. So if you can put somebody's individual, uh, the, the thing they are having trouble forgiving themselves for within that context, I think they can, that there's relief there. So I just want to add that. Yeah, that's a product point. of the culture at the time. Yes, yeah, good sure. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's pack a picnic and go and watch someone get beheaded. Well, I'd, I'd rather watch Netflix. <laughs> Thank you, Adele. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay. What do you think, Holly? Well, let's see if everybody feels complete. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. It was fabulous. And welcome to all of you who are new to our organization. Yes, very much so. Really lovely to have new people show up and participate. If you want to have a recording of this 
meeting in a couple of weeks. It's going to be on our YouTube channel, which you can link to on the website, right? But I will also put a link to it on the um, newsletter when it comes out so you can get it from there as well. And the notes? Those are neat. Well, I'm going to compile them. I'm, Peter's solidifying what he's going to add. So I will be sending that out to everybody that was here today. And, and if you have any questions about any of this, contact me. I'm happy to support you because I know how, how confusing or how intimidating this can be, but helps all around. So I'm happy to, to uh, share my perspective or protocols that I have. And you'll find on the website the presentation I gave on working with karmic contracts involving this type of work, bringing in Kuan Yin and so on, all of that entire presentation is available in paper form. You can download the protocols. So please do so, <laughs> use them or ask questions of me about them because I'm happy to support you. And in, in January, I have my four meeting spirit releasement training going on. It's on Friday, starting January the 10th. Anyway, it's, it'll be on the handout that I send you. And it's very hands-on. You practice between weeks with your partners, um, do a lot of consultation work. If you're working with clients, you're welcome to start doing it with your clients and we can do supervision around your experiences. It's very much a, uh, a mentoring process into doing this work. And you do need to have hypnotherapy training to do at least 100 hours. And so trust the process. Be, you know, you're... You'll be uh, clients will seek you out that are not off the wall clients. Just mm -hmm. start slowly and just ask for help, and the clients will show up. And I think you'll be very pleased with how easy it is to follow these protocols. And as Holly mentioned, they have their own rhythm to them. And so it's typically you follow that protocol, and oh my gosh, things unfold as they're supposed to, and the client is helped. And you're feeling good about it too. <laughs> So thank you all for joining us. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Holly and Peter. Thank I'm you. That was great. Really great. Take care, everybody. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thanks. Good night. Night. That was lovely, Virginia. Well, you and Peter did a great job. Thanks. Thanks for your support. I didn't see. I didn't check in the heyday of how many people were here. I saw 24 were there more than that at one point.